This is my first video update coming to you from Athens, Greece. On this Saturday morning, let's talk about some news. The big story from yesterday was the uh, G7 finance ministers agreeing to implement a price cap for global purchases of Russian oil. Let me read you the statement from the G7 when they confirmed this decision. Quote, we confirm our joint political intention to finalize and implement a comprehensive prohibition of services which enable maritime transportation of Russian crude oil, of Russian origin crude oil, and petroleum products globally. The provision of such services would only be allowed if the oil and petroleum products are purchased, are purchased at or below a price, quote, the price cap, determined by the broad coalition of countries adhering to and, implement, and implementing the price cap. Now, no details were given as to how they're going to enforce this and what, what the mechanisms are going to be to, uh, to come up with this, uh, this price cap. But the goals that the G7 ministers uh, stated for this, uh, for this price cap were twofold. Number one, to limit upward pressure on global oil prices. And two, to curb Russia's revenue from oil sales. Here is what U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said with regards to this G7 agreement, quote, the price cap will advance our two key objectives. The first, of course, is reducing revenues that Putin needs to continue waging his war of aggression. And the second is maintaining a reliable supply of oil to the global market and putting downward pressure on the price of energy for people in the U.S., in the U.K., and around the world. So, of course, the Kremlin is just not going to sit back and, uh, and take this. They're going to respond and they're going to retaliate. And here is the first initial response from Moscow, coming from the Deputy Prime Minister Alexander Novak. He said, quote, we will simply not supply oil and petroleum products to such companies or states that impose restrictions as we will not work non-competitively. Novak said while denouncing the price cap as completely absurd, it will completely destroy the market. Novak continued arguing that interference in market mechanisms in a key commodity like oil would have a destabilizing impact on energy security in countries across the world. Yeah, this is not a good idea. This is not a good idea at all. So Bloomberg is saying that uh, the G7, the sweet spot for the, for the price cap is going to be around $50 to $60 per barrel. They're taking into consideration that Russia, the Russian operating uh, budget, it needs oil to be at around $40 uh, a barrel in order for uh, Russia to, to continue to, to produce and to sell uh, oil on, uh, on the market. So they're, they're looking to take it down from, say, the $80 a barrel mark. Let's just say it's at $80, $80 a barrel. They're looking to take it down to around $50 to $60 so that, uh, so that the thinking goes that Russia is going to continue to supply oil to the markets, but uh, it's not going to be raking in the, the massive profits that uh, it has been raking in over the past six months since the, uh, the special military operation. That's kind of the thinking as to what, uh, what the G7 is doing. The EU also has their own um, oil, oil embargo slash, I don't want to say price cap, but, but embargo on insurance for, uh, for tankers as well with regards to Russian oil. They, they passed this during the, uh, the sixth energy package, which was about, I believe it was sometime in June. And uh, the European Union, they decided to, uh, to phase in an embargo on Russian oil, which is going to come into effect 
I believe in around January. And what this embargo would entail is that EU countries would not be allowed to import um, Russian oil via, via tanker, via ship. And, um, and they, put, they also put in place these, uh, these insurance uh, sanctions, meaning that any tanker that was, uh, was importing Russian oil would not, uh, would not be getting insured to import that oil. And then they created a bunch of carve outs for oil coming in via pipeline. Um, for example, Hungary, which relies via the Druz, the Druzba uh, pipeline, they rely on Russian oil through those, uh, through those mechanisms. And the EU said, we're going to accept Hungary from the oil embargo up until a certain uh, time period. I believe it was set for like 2023 or 2024. I could be wrong on the time period, but uh, Hungary has, uh, say, about a year, give or take. To, uh, to figure out alternative ways to get oil, to, uh, to move away from Russian oil. But until then, we're going to create this carve out and we're going to allow the oil to come through a pipeline. They created all these carve outs um, with regards to, to the EU's embargo. So just to paint the picture, now you have a type of quasi EU Russian oil embargo that is being phased in over time. Uh, you have the EU imposing a type of, uh, of insurance, um, insurance sanctions with regards to Russian oil coming into the European Union. And now you have the G7 coming on top of all of this. And they're saying, now we're going to work to impose a type of global embargo on Russian oil. And that embargo is going to be enforced. As you heard from the G7 uh, statement, it's going to be enforced by uh, looking to to uh, embargo any types of uh, of insurance or services to uh, to countries that do not follow this price cap, any countries that are looking to to circumvent this price cap, well, they're not going to uh, they're not going to receive, for example, uh, financing to transport that oil or or the tankers aren't going to receive insurance for uh, for that oil and stuff like that. So that's how they're those are the first indications, at least, as to how they're going to enforce these these mechanisms. But we haven't gotten the exact details of this. So um, three scenarios. Let me give you three scenarios from Zero Hedge and then let me give you three scenarios from Goldman, Goldman Sachs. So Zero Hedge says this with regards to this price cap. They say scenario one, Russia does not cooperate and retaliates. A three MBD cut would likely deliver a $190 um, barrel oil price. $190 oil price. Scenario two, China and India don't cooperate. The end of the European insurance dominance. And scenario three, Russia fully reroutes exports from west to east, but loses pricing power. Prices stabilize in the low 100s. Scenario two with regards to China and India is, uh, is referencing the fact that there are certain countries which, has, which have already come out and said, we're not going to play along with your price cap. Uh, China has indicated that they're not going to play along with it. India has indicated they're not going to play along with it. Turkey um opec saudi arabia the opec producers the gulf states they've warned uh the collective west not to do this it's already a very tight uh, market don't go through with this, this is what saudi arabia said you're going to blow apart the entire market you're going to create a ton of instability and uh we just don't need that right now but no one was uh no one is listening to uh, to saudi arabia and as far as china and india go well in order for this to work, this price cap to really work, you're gonna to have to get the whole world on board. We already know that, uh, well, we're pretty confident that China's not gonna be on board with this, especially given all of the, uh, the escalation with regard to Taiwan and, and everything going on there. I would be very surprised if China jumps on this. India has indicated that they're not going to, uh, to jump on this either. We know that India is, is making a ton of money buying Russian oil at a discount 
refining it and then sending it back out onto the market. So they're making a ton of money. So the incentives for India to uh, jump on board with this price cap, it's going to it's going to have to be very, very big. But um, India is the key player. This is who the collective West, the United States this is who they're going to focus on. They're going to try to focus on uh, getting India on board, China, Turkey, other uh, other countries. Mm. I, 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 don't, I don't think they're going to have uh, an easy go about it, getting them on board. But uh, India, I think, is the country that the collective West is most concerned about. And that's going to be the country that they're going to try to uh, to sway over onto their side with regards to the price cap. But let me read you three scenarios from um, Goldman Sachs. And they follow along the lines of the three scenarios from Zero Hedge as to how this could all shake out. What Goldman Sachs is, uh, is saying is that scenario number one, Russia stops all exports, taking 10.5 million barrels per day off the market. Prices shoot to $280 a barrel. The world economy <laughs> goes, to, goes to the crapper. At 190, it'll go to the crapper, but 280, okay. But I, I, I don't think Russia would, is going to pull everything off off the market. Scenario number two, Russia continues to sell and OPEC is forced to sell under the Russian price cap to compete in Asia. This would mean that the collective West kind of uh, controls the price of oil. It's kind of like Russia saying, you know what, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to say anything about this. We're going to continue to, to put oil out on the market and um, this 50 to $60 well, okay, we're still making a uh, profit on the oil or we're breaking even on the oil production. And so c'est la vie, right? There, that, that's, that's what this scenario too is saying. But, you know, that would mean that all of OPEC, Saudi Arabia, everybody is now going to be forced to sell at, these, uh, at this price cap uh, uh, price. And that would, that would mean that the collective West this uh, this cartel of countries right the g7 the eu that would mean that they're going to take a victory lap because in essence they control the price of oil all, all, all the control for the price has left uh opec they've left the oil producers and now it's this uh this buyer's cartel that is going to dictate the price that would that that is what this scenario would mean so I see absolutely zero possibility of Russia saying, OK, we'll play along. We'll continue to uh, to put oil out there and produce oil at these prices. And uh, we lose. We give up. Uh, U.S., EU, you now control the price of oil. That's not going to happen. Scenario three is that OPEC realizes that uh, that the U.S. is 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 screwing over the market essentially and uh and they say you know what screw you screw your market manipulation screw your uh this this little cartel power move that you're that you're trying to put in place to take away the power from us and shift it over to you and we're going to start to uh to work outside of the dollar that's the third scenario. And that's the scenario that uh, is a real distinct possibility. This would essentially mean that the petrodollar is, is over, it's done with, and uh, all, all, all kinds of, uh, <laughs> of chaos that takes place. I mean, you know, th this, this is a likely scenario. Um, OPEC is furious and Saudi Arabia has already indicated that they're going to be furious if this happens. They say, you know what? This is, uh, we, we see what you're doing. We see the power grab that you're trying to put in place. We're not going to play along. All of OPEC doesn't play along. Russia doesn't play along. And uh, slowly, slowly, they, uh, they start to ditch the, the petrodollar. That is probably the most likely scenario so i've given you a bunch of scenarios from uh from zero hedge from goldman sachs some of those scenarios overlap but uh i, I think we could all come to the conclusion that russia is not going to play along with this 
they're uh, they're not just going to to wave the white white flag and say, okay, we surrender. We'll play along and deliver oil at fifty dollars or sixty dollars a barrel, and and you guys win. That is not going to happen. Um, it's going to be very difficult to get the entire world on board. It's going to be very difficult to uh, to continue your dominance in the insurance markets as well. We've had indications that Lloyd's in London, they're not playing along with uh, the EU insurance uh, sanctions. And so I think this is an indication. This was this was a story from the Financial Times that actually the Duran, we reported on it about, I want to say like three, four weeks ago, how uh, how London, the London insurance market is is not fully on board with the EU uh, sanctions on uh, on the insurance of tankers that are delivering Russian oil. And so if one of the mechanisms to control the price, which I'm 99.9 percent sure to be used is going to be the uh, not issuing insurance to uh, to tankers, to companies, to countries that are transporting Russian oil. Well, that's going to be very, very difficult to enforce, and that's going to blow apart the the UK EU dominance of the insurance markets because we've already had indications from India, from China, and from Russia that they will insure uh, the delivery of Russian oil. They're going to start to build a parallel market to uh, to the tanker insurance dominance of uh, of the collective West, to the shipping insurance dominance of the collective West. And so that's going to be um, a boomerang effect of this uh, of this uh, price cap. But the, the most likely scenario is is that OPEC's not going to play along. Russia's not going to play along. They're seeing what the collective West is doing, and they're going to say these guys are a bunch of incompetent crazies. They're looking to take our power and money. Think about that. OPEC is going to say you guys want to take our our cartel away from us and shift it to you guys by creating this little buyer's market, no chance, no chance. And Russia has said, you know what? At the end of the day, we just won't deliver oil to, uh, to countries that actually um, enforce this price cap. It, it, this is gonna cause just all kinds of, of instability uh, in the market. I mean, this is going to be a nightmare. This is gonna be an absolute nightmare, but you know, they pulled the trigger. So that is the situation with the oil price cap and the G7 decision to, uh, to follow pretty much along the same lines as the EU and uh, try to put this price cap in place. Let's wait uh, a couple of days and see exactly what, uh, what the mechanisms um, are going to be with regards to, to enforcing this price cap. One of them will be the insurance on not providing insurance to, uh, to tankers and to shipping companies and to countries that decide to uh, to move Russian oil. This is going to be a big, big disaster. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you while you're while you're implementing one disaster, why not implement a second disaster? And who better to implement a second disaster than Ursula van der Crazy <laughs> and Ursula van der Crazy she has come out with a statement saying that now is the time for the European Union to put in place a price cap for Russian gas. <laughs> so we got the, uh, the G7 price cap on Russian oil, and now we are going to get, according to Van der Crazy, a price cap on Russian gas. That's not going to cause any problems, is it? <laughs> So uh, the EU needs a price ceiling on imports of Russian pipeline gas, according to European Commission President Ursula van der Kreisi. She announced this on Friday, and this is according to Reuters. Here is her quote. I firmly believe that it, that it is now time for a price cap on Russian pipeline gas to Europe, she told reporters on the sidelines of a meeting of German conservative lawmakers in the town of Murnau. 
Van der Crazy insists that the measure would prevent what she called Russian President Vladimir Putin's attempt to manipulate the European energy market. EU energy ministers are expected to discuss the issue during an extraordinary meeting on September 9th. Former President Dmitry Medvedev warned on Friday that in the event of the introduction of such a price cap, EU nations won't get any Russian gas. It will be like with oil. There will be no Russian gas in Europe, Medvedev wrote on his Telegram channel. Medvedev said the same thing with oil when they were talking, when the EU was talking about putting together an, um, a price cap, uh, when the G7 started to kick around the price cap, Yellen was the first one to talk about an oil price cap. Medvedev said, you know, no business in their right mind would, uh, would sell a product at a loss over, um, over a, an extended period of time. No business is going to sell a product, a product and lose money. So why should Russia? And now he's saying the same thing. If, uh, if the EU goes ahead and puts a price cap on Russian gas, which I'm confident they will, the fact that Van der Crazy is saying this means that uh, there's a will and a determination to do this, then it means that Russia is just going to stop all the gas coming into the European Union. And um, this is not just Nord Stream 1. This is everything, including the transit gas that moves through Ukraine and the uh, the transit fees that ukraine is still um extracting from uh from the gas that moves from their territory not to mention the fact that they siphon off a lot of this gas and they blackmail the european union with regards to this gas that transits via pipelines in ukraine but this would basically mean all the gas to europe is going to be cut off if you take this threat from uh Dmitry Medvedev seriously, and I see no need not to, because the uh, the Russians, the Kremlin has shown that uh, they have no problem toying around with the EU when it comes to uh, to gas supplies, and uh, we have the the story, the news that uh, Nord Stream One is now going to move into a period of extended maintenance. <laughs> extended maintenance and this has to do with the fact that uh gasprom has found um an oil leak i believe actually three oil leaks in uh, Nord Stream one as it was undergoing these uh this three four day period of maintenance which was previously announced this was no secret that Nord Stream one would be shut off completely to undergo um, a routine maintenance for three to four days. And during this maintenance, would you believe that uh, Gazprom found um, an oil leak? <laughs> and interestingly enough, the discovery of this uh, oil leak during repairs of, uh, of Nord Stream 1, during maintenance of Nord Stream 1, pretty much followed in line with Ursula van der Crazy's announcement of some sort of uh, price cap needing to uh to be put in place on russian gas isn't that interesting russia's energy giant gazprom announced on friday the suspension of natural gas supplies to the eu via Nord Stream one pipeline for an indefinite period due to technical malfunctions the pipeline was supposed to restart on september 3rd following repairs to its sole operating turbine according to the company it received a warning from russia's industrial regulator Rostek Nadzor about the turbine failure. The problems were reportedly detected during scheduled maintenance work, and the pipeline will not be able to operate without proper repair, according to Gazprom. The Russian firm said that it has informed German manufacturer Siemens about the turbine's failure and the need for an overhaul. <laughs> oh, man. Gazprom, uh, Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 1 has gone from 100% to 60% to 20% to 0%. And, and that's not the kicker to all of this. That is not the kicker to all of this. I can't confirm this 100%. But from what I understand, from what I understand, these oil leaks, these three oil leaks, that have been uh, spotted by Gazprom in these turbines 
these oil leaks in three turbines, sorry, these oil leaks in three turbines that Gazprom has detected, well, the only place that these turbines can be fixed is, you guessed it, Canada. <laughs> and uh, from what I understand, Siemens, they're kind of, um, they've issued statements saying that they're kind of at uh, a wait and see uh, level right now. They're kind of saying, you know what? We're not sure if we're contracted to fix such types of leaks. That's what Siemens said. But Siemens has also said, we're on standby. And uh, if there is maintenance that is needed, we're on standby to see exactly what's, uh, what's going on. So uh, <laughs> it looks like Olaf Schultz is going to have to uh, call Justin Trudeau again and <laughs> send another three turbines Trudeau's way. Oh boy. Ring, ring. Uh, yes, hello? Justin. Justin, this is Olaf Schultz, Chancellor of Germany. Oh, hey, Olaf. How you doing? How are things going in Germany? Did you fix that turbine uh, thing that, that we were talking about last time? No, Trudeau, you idiot. You still have one turbine. Actually, I think you have five turbines with you. Oh, do we? Oh, well, let me follow up on that and see if, uh, if we fix those turbines and we can send them your way. Look, 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 Trudeau, forget those turbines. I've got a new problem. Really, Olaf? What's that? Well, here's the deal, Trudeau. Uh, Gazprom, they've notified me that they have three turbines that now need repair. And uh, Siemens is going to have to send those turbines your way because, according to Gazprom, they have an oil leak. And you're going to have to fix it, Trudeau. I'm going to have to fix it? Look, Olaf, I'm not really good with, you know, fixing stuff. Hammers and screwdrivers and nails. I'm not really good with that kind of stuff. No, Trudeau, you idiot. Not you have to fix it. Your team has to fix it. Oh, oh, you mean my technicians and my engineers. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, Olaf, send those turbines uh, our way and, and we'll fix them up. But it might take some time to, to fix the turbines because, you see, we had an incident uh, a couple of days ago with our finance minister, Christia Freeland, in Alberta. And, and some people were really mean to her. And so now, you know, I've got all government employees taking classes on, on politeness and, uh, and just basically how to be nicer to, uh, to the people that rule over them. And so, you know, these classes are going to last for a couple of months and everyone's going to be really busy learning a proper etiquette to, towards their rulers, uh, Olaf. Trudeau, I don't have time for any of your woke BS. I got to get those turbines fixed. I got to get them to Russia. If I don't get them to Russia, I'm done for. I'm not going to be Chancellor of Germany anymore. Can you help me, Trudeau? Olaf, I really wish I could. And I promise you that in, that in the next three to six months, I'll free up some people to fix those turbines and I'll get them back to you. But for the time being, these courses teaching our employees teaching government officials to be nice to people like Christia Freeland. Well, they just take priority, Olaf. I'm really, really sorry. I hope things work out. Trudeau, you idiot. You've just destroyed my political career. Are you happy? Well, I can't really say, Olaf. I need to search my emotions. Right now, I'm kind of indifferent towards you, and I really don't like your tone. <laughs> Bye, Olaf. <laughs> so that's the situation. <laughs> that is the situation. Oh, boy. I, I'm going to follow up, and I'm going to try to confirm that uh, these turbines actually do need to be sent to, uh, to Canada. And if that is the case, then, oh, boy. Oh, boy. So... Let's wrap up this video and let's do some quick stories. Um, <laughs> what a mess.
what a freaking disaster the collective west leadership is by the way i think they're i think they're doing something here they're going to have some sort of fair or, or something's going to going to take place here as you can see there they've got everything set up for something we'll see um let's see ukraine they admitted to actually uh bombing the nuclear plant in zaporozhye they came out with a statement the other day and uh they they inadvertently by mistake i believe they admitted that they were actually bombing the zaporozhye nuclear power plant this is what the uh defense ministry of ukraine said in one of their briefings they said uh in the areas of the settlements of Kherson and Energodar, accurate strikes by our troops destroyed three enemy artillery systems as well as an ammunition depot and up to a company of personnel. This is what the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine said. This was during a daily briefing. The military also claimed that due to the arrival of the IAEA inspection team, the Russian occupiers removed all military equipment from the territory of Zaporozhye nuclear power plants. About 100 units moved to the, to the plant Atom and Ergomash, and the rest were dispersed in the near settlement. So basically, in, uh, in an effort to make themselves look like they're, uh, they're successful in their military campaign against the Russians, the Ukrainian Mil Ministry of Defense actually admitted that they were indeed uh, shelling the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. I thought that was an interesting admission. Uh, while we're on the subject of the nuclear power plant, uh, <laughs> Zelensky's uh, aide, this guy Zelensky's buddy and aide, Michael Podoliak, actually said that the IAEA should not be trusted by default. Quote, I don't like international institutions and mediation missions in general. They look extremely ineffective, extremely cowardly, and extremely unprofessional, said Michael Podoliak. This applies not only to the IAEA, but also to the UN, Amnesty International, and the International Committee of the Red Cross, the Ukrainian official claimed, adding, by default, you should not trust them. You know, I mean, <laughs> I kind of agree with him here. I really do. But, uh, you know, all these agencies that he named off have been, you know, 100% on Ukraine's side since the beginning of the, of the conflict. But because Amnesty International kind of threw Ukraine under the bus for one report and because the IAEA is going to most likely, you know, sort out the, the Zaporozhye, um, the Zaporozhye incident and the Zaporozhye crisis because they're there on the ground and they're going to see what's actually taking place. You're now seeing Ukraine say, you know what, don't believe any of these guys. They're all liars. <laughs> they don't get what they want. Everyone's a liar. These guys are spoiled children. Let's go this way. Let's go this way. See where we end up. So that was an interesting statement from uh, Podoliak. And finally, let's do a couple of, uh, of clown worlds. And the first clown world is just a story that I've wanted to actually do for a while now, for a few days, and it has to do with uh, the Netherlands, this is a quick clown world. Uh, we are getting reports that in the Netherlands, the cost of loading a full tank for an electric car is now higher than the cost of loading a full tank for a gasoline car. And I say full tank in, in quotes. It costs more now to charge up your electric vehicle than to charge up a gasoline car in uh, the Netherlands. I don't know if that's still true, but you know, the price of electricity is, uh, <laughs> it's gone, it's gone through the roof in the, in the EU, in Europe. And it's now created uh, dynamics where if you have an electric car, well, it's actually more expensive to, uh, to charge up that, that electric car than to just fill up your normal, regular, trusted gasoline car <laughs> and the uh and the final clown world has to do with shoigu yes sergey shoigu who has suffered 24 heart attacks and according to the daily mail putin had vanquished him into the dungeons underneath the kremlin because 
Russia was losing so badly in the conflict with Ukraine that Putin had had enough of Shoigu. And according to the Daily Mail, he told Shoigu, you're out. I don't want to hear from you. He didn't say he's going to fire him. He said, I just don't want to hear from you. And Putin decided to get um, to get all of his briefings from other other military personnel and commanders. He shunned Shoigu. Well, Shoigu has kind of turned up again. Isn't that interesting? He has turned up and he has given a statement. <laughs> and, and the clown world is that he's turned up, but he's given a statement. And he said on Friday during a conference call that um, the Ukrainian armed forces attempts at an offensive continue on the Nikolaev, Krivorovsk, and other directions, and the enemy is suffering considerable losses. Shoigu also went on to allege that the counteroffensive had been planned by Ukrainian President Zelensky's office solely to create the illusion before the Western backers that the Ukraine military is able to conduct an offensive. And um, Shoigu also said, by the way, that uh, many foreign mercenaries were killed, claiming that its troops claimed that Russia had killed over a thousand Ukrainian service members, as well as foreign mercenaries. I've heard the number to be around the 3,000 range, plus or minus. The whole counteroffensive has been a complete disaster, but actually they launched a third wave, which also ended up in disaster as well. Ukraine launched a third wave in Kherson, and that didn't go over well at all. But here you have Shoigu coming out of exile to uh, actually give a statement and say that the Kherson counteroffensive has been a disaster, that... Uh, he actually said that the Russian military is now pretty much where they were, where everything was before the Kherson counteroffensive took place. In other words, all of this, this stuff that went on for the past three, four days has resulted in pretty much minimal to zero territorial gains via, via Ukraine. And he made a statement to, to, uh, to say that foreign mercenaries were also killed in this uh, this counteroffensive. Anyway, that is the clown world. That's kind of a clown world, but uh, the gasoline prices and the electric car prices, that is indeed a clown world. Anyway, I'm going to sign out from Athens, Greece, uh, the Duran.locals.com. Check out Alexander's channel. Check out the Duran's channel and look for us on Rumble, on Odyssey, BitChute, Shoot, and Telegram. Take care. It's a book festival. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>